Before anyone ever hears your music, they need to be convinced to listen. It could be that they see a blog review, maybe they're getting a recommendation from a friend, or they see a cool Instagram ad, a fancy album cover. Something grabs them that feels intriguing about the, the, the music, so they want to press play. But sometimes it's the description of the music that captures someone's imagination. You don't have all day, though, so your description has got to pack a punch, which is why in this episode of the DIY Musician Podcast, we're going to help you come up with a compelling elevator pitch for your unique sound. Let's get into it. You're listening to the CD Baby. CD Baby. CD Baby. CD Baby. DIY, DIY. Oh. Musician <laughs> Podcast. <laughs> Hey, welcome to episode 310 of the DIY Musician Podcast, where today we're going to tell you how to craft better descriptions for your music. And joining me is Christina Cano. How's it Hello. going? Hello. Hi. How are you? Is it as warm or warmer in Los Angeles as it is in Maine today? I don't know how hot it is in Maine today. How hot is it? It's like 90. Oh, well, it's less warm than that, but it feels different. I do live by the beach, so there's this nice little breeze that I often get, but I live in a house that doesn't have AC, so it just can get really like stuffy, and yeah. sometimes it can be a little bit of a challenge, but it's okay. We good. I'm I'm a bad uh, environmentalist today because I have my AC cranked, but- uh, Oh, I'm jealous. I wish. Well, today you and I are going to be discussing something I, I think you will enjoy. We're going to Talk about how to pitch your music, how to describe it. Not how to pitch it, but how to describe it when you pitch it. Sure, absolutely. I think one of my favorite things is when you ask anybody, including if anyone asks me, tell me about your music. And then there's that glaze that goes uh, over their eyes like, oh, uh, and I never, I mean, you have to have a little bit of an elevator pitch ready to go in your pocket. Otherwise, you're just going to be like, it's like, um folk but like electronic <laughs> you lost me dude <laughs> exactly well then not only do you need like that good elevator pitch at the ready but your music changes every couple years mm -hmm. usually so then you need to keep thinking about what it should be so that's what we're going to talk about in this episode i'll give you a brief little table of content so you know what to expect and then we have a, a quick commercial for you and then we'll get into the discussion but first we're gonna talk about why you need an elevator pitch how to use it, what it should contain and what it should absolutely not contain, how to come up with one. And then we actually asked the CD Baby community to submit their own description. So we got really a, quite a bunch of uh, replies on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook that we'll use. And thanks to those who submitted their descriptions because you're very brave and we might uh, tear them to shreds. So that'll be fun. But first, I feel like everyone who listens to this podcast has heard us talk about our conference to death, but we would be remiss if we didn't mention it, right? Absolutely. Okay. For those of you that haven't, for whatever reason, listened to the podcast enough to know that we have a conference. It's August 26th through 28th in Austin, Texas, the DIY Musician Conference. It's going to be basically a three-day party for independent artists. And the guest list is massive and packed. We've got Spotify, we got Amazon, we've got YouTube, we've got all the DSPs, but then more, I mean, on top of that, we have some genius music industry experts. We've got other artists that you're going to be really excited to be inspired by, one-on-one -on -one mentoring, some networking, and then performance opportunities up the waz. So it's going to be a good weekend. It's going to be hot. It's going to be fun and i hope you come tickets are available now on diymusiciancon.com well no one needs to hear us say any more about it except that it's a blast and you should be there we hope to hang out for the weekend it'll be amazing so let's get into our discussion why the heck does an artist need an elevator pitch you did pr for do you still do publicity for bands sometimes yeah uh and it is the number one sort of like existential issue for artists is having to define themselves which is often why they try to hire someone else to do it for them or you know honestly the number one advice i give is ask questions ask your friends to help you answer this question it's not that hard for them if you just give them like let's say you have a new song coming out maybe your your style has changed like you said in the last year or so generally most people unless they do huge leaps like from country to 
like reggae or something, unless yeah, yeah. You're going like a huge, huge, huge genre leap, they're generally a little too generous with the, well, my sound changes all the time thing, because most of us, as long as we're just trying to sound like ourselves, will inherently sound unique. It's finding that lightning and like how to capture that at sort of like a lightning in a bottle of describing that that thing that is unique to you that doesn't that can even transcend the fluidity of your sound. Yeah. And I think that um, my old friend, Lisa Lapine, who we've mentioned a lot on the show, said it best. She said, your music is the last thing that matters. But once they get to it, it's the only thing that matters. So no matter who you're talking to, whether it's a blogger or you want to, you know, get signed to a label or whatever it is, you're just in the barber shop and your barber's like, what do you sound like? You need something to plant that seed of curiosity that, you know, either lets them know, well, that's not, I don't care. I don't want to know that, which is important. Like, or, well, that sounds interesting. Let me go listen. And then once they get to the music, then whether it's any good or not is the only thing that matters, but there's a long way to go before they get to that point. Exactly. And the barbershop chair is actually a really great example. Cause I think that nine out of 10 times when I go to get a haircut, that's when, I run through that. Uh, it's like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, you're like, like you're there because you want to look good on stage and you're like, yeah. I haven't gotten hair. Yeah. I think that there are a few different things that you need to do here. There's the one for like your cool artsy music industry people who like really want to hear something different, <laughs> you know, like, like give them a little sizzle. But then remember that like the majority of music listeners in the world probably listen to like, top 40 or aren't as like niche listeners as the as your people or as like or as you definitely are as the smart brilliant artist that you are so thinking about how you can find someone relatable that everybody knows is often a good place even if you're like me don't want to do that because you're like but i'm so different i'm so special i sound nothing like lady gaga but if that's what your grandma keeps saying you sound like then lean into that with people who won't care to know the difference yeah and <laughs> later on we'll get into sort of how to use those sort of components to make it uh mm -hmm. make kind of immediate emotional sense to your just common person who isn't a music geek like you're saying but just a few more reasons why you should have an elevator pitch at the ready is a lot of times you're kind of hand feeding journalists. Like if you're doing a PR campaign, you will notice the 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 reviewer, the writer will sometimes like verbatim borrow what you tell them. And so you're making it very easy first to know whether they want to investigate your music. But even if they like it, sometimes they'll be like, oh, I'll just use that. So you're kind of writing your own good press in a way. I think that that is probably one of the most misunderstood things about PR is that I would I would even argue that it's like 90% of the times that you read a feature about an artist that wasn't written by that writer that was written by a publicist who sent it out in a press release and then that writer took the exact copy and put it into publish it and that was it that's how that works unless it's like an interview or right. or a review likely if it's just like you see one of those like two paragraph things about an artist's recent review that just came out today it's generally written about by the publicist yeah so another few benefits of having these things like the barber chair you want it to come out very fast and be very confident and clear so write it in advance you want to define your sound who it's for who it's not for but another benefit is that once you've defined it and put it in words you kind of have a litmus test that you can gauge all your other branding decisions by and i've found in the past that when i've said my music is this or at least my, this album is this then anything else the photos mm -hmm. i take the things i say on social the way i design a stage everything can be in service to like does it meet this expectation of my description or not and if it doesn't okay. you know you can fix it so i've found that really beneficial in the past as well Absolutely. Trying to figure out what it is that you are right up front is going to help your campaign for the entire album or single release. Yeah. So once you've come up with a description, which hopefully by the end of this episode, you'll be on your way to that. What do you do with it? Well, you obviously you tell the person in the barber chair, mm -hmm. you put it on your social bios, you put it on your website. A lot of times you'll see an artist's website will have their name and then right below it will be the kind of tweet size description of their music. Um, yeah. 
can put it in your email signature, press releases, your bio, um, your and Spotify then- profile, your Apple Music profile, your Amazon for Music profile. I would recommend, I know that for those of you that have heard me on this podcast before, I talk about spreadsheets. They're really helpful having a spreadsheet that you have every single place that you are visible on the internet that you personally can edit so that whenever you have a release, you can go in and make sure everything is consistent and updated because I can't tell you how many times somebody has thought that their bio was updated because they put it up on Spotify, but then a booker or a writer takes a bio from their band camp from 2011 that talks about how they're a solo traveling acoustic songwriter and they're like no i've evolved i don't know where are they getting this info well it's because you didn't update all of your, all of your all stuff. places <laughs> no. yeah. that, well, that and, info exists out there yeah an- another thing which i feel like people don't talk about enough is is not only are you defining yourself for you in all of your places like you're saying have a have a, a, a list of every place you're representing yourself but you're also giving your fans something to say about you so like if someone was like, describe Radiohead. Well, I love that band, but I'd still kind of have to think about it for a second. I'd be like, okay. It's like, actually, that's so funny that you say that. I was I was thinking about that yesterday because I was listening to Radiohead all weekend because I was in that mood. Uh And I was thinking about (laughs) <laughs> well, no, it's good. It's fine. It's just sometimes I need to get into like that solo, just listens to Radiohead sort uh-huh. of vibe uh, while she cleans the house. But I was listening to Amnesiac and then I was listening to some of their newer things and thinking, wow, their sound is so defined, but I can't define it. I can't say exactly what it is or even how it works. <laughs> yeah, but but like, imagine it, Radiohead's not the band that would ever do this, but like imagine they did and they had some like, five word little pithy quote mm-hmm. that you like, oh that's how they describe it so i will just it comes out of your mouth you're like kind mm-hmm. of doing that grassroots work for the band and uh but oh. then if you were to just go into a record store and you need to know where to find radiohead you know to find it in alternative yeah. there's then there's that right like there's these like lab, quick labels that they're going to throw or a quick genre that they're going to ask you to fill out on the DSP uploads or whatever. And you have to also just be accepting of those things too and recognize that your brilliant music may not fit in a specific niche, but you have to find the one that it like just slides under enough. Before we get into how to come up with one, we should say in general what it should and shouldn't contain. And, and you were just saying like the genre can be an element of it. Yeah. Uh, it but be. I like to remind people it does not need to, and it can't tell your whole story. It can mm-hmm. encompass all of your brilliance, like you're saying. So mm-hmm. it really is a soundbite. It's meant yeah. to not pigeonhole you, but just give someone kind of the, you know, like when you're about to go on a trail and it just is like, you are here. Yeah. That's all it is. It's like an mm-hmm. orientation point. Yeah. So- Let the music speak for itself. I'll tell you my number one pet peeve from a bio. Are you ready? Oh, yeah. One of my biggest pet peeves on a bio, and some of you might go in and either hate this, that I'm saying it, or go and edit it. I don't know. I hope. Is when somebody says, I'll speak for myself, Christina Cano has been playing music since she was three years old (laughs) and studied piano until she was 10 and taught herself guitar and now she's playing shows. It's like, I, no one wants to know your origin story of how you learned the instruments. What they want to know, origin story is still good. We like to know where you're from. We like to know all, you know, like maybe if you have, like if you came from a very musical family and that's a really important part of your story, like that's okay. But we don't need to know, like you went to middle school band and that's how you picked up the clarinet, you know? Like, let's hear about what you've done with the clarinet sense. Right. Yeah, that makes a lot of I mean, th- we always joke about, like, don't tell people where you were born and when you were born and all that stuff, unless it's so integral to your story and your music that that, that I mean, matters. If you're General- making Appalachian music, you can mention that you're from that region. Or if it's integral into your identity as a musician, I think it's okay to mention, like, where you're from, especially now that it's a thing that people are doing a lot more of. We all want to sort of be identified by where we're from or or those sorts of things. And I think that's okay. But being, unless it's just irrelevant. If it's yeah. like Chris Rodley was born in, I don't even know where you're born, Maine? Well, Rhode Island. <laughs> in Rhode Island, um, period. Okay. 
Yeah, like. <laughs> <more>. <laughs> So like you mentioned uh, identifying or identity, and I feel like that is one of the things that a description should do. It should let the uh, audience identify or, or, or let the person decide whether they identify with your audience or not. So like who your music is for, what it's for, if it's for a particular cause or activity or mood, what you stand for and what you stand against, maybe what you sound like or who you sound like. You can use some genre stuff. I would definitely avoid using very technical or theoretical jargon. Like no one cares that you play a seven string guitar and you use the Mixolydian scale. Like what does that mean to anyone? Yeah. So you want to be more evocative in terms of mood, emotion, stuff like that. Yeah. You're squinting as if you disagree. No, I agree with that 100%. I'm I'm just keep thinking back to this one bio that I recently had to edit that really bugged me. <laughs> oh, go into it. <laughs> okay. So it started off with how they learned to play their instruments in school, sure. <laughs> um and then it went into how n- they're so misunderstood and nobody gets them. And, oh, boy. and how like they're a genius because they know how to play all these instruments, but that they've always been an outcast and no one even wants to listen to their music. And I remember being like, how is this a pitch? <laughs> like, how is this going to help you sell records? You know, tell um, immediately off the bat, identifying that you're somehow not worthy of people's attention in your own mind's eye is only going to manifest that for you. So you have to do a little bit of like hyping yourself. And I think that's the thing that people don't like to do. Although I would almost argue that this person saying that they were so misunderstood is hyping themselves. But I yeah. think one of the things that is really hard for people is to learn how to be like sort of promotionally like with their language without feeling that thing of like, Oh, I don't deserve to say this, or I'm going to sound like I'm bragging or those sorts of things. Nope. Just describing yourself is not bragging. It's just. You and and I talk about that a lot. It's like artists and and I'm one of them suffer from this weird false humility where internally we think we're a genius. Mm -hmm. Why else would we make music if we expect people to listen, if we didn't believe in ourselves, but then when we're given the opportunity to sell someone on it or to introduce someone to it, we get all shy and like, we're embarrassed as if like to say, this is what it is. And I think you'll love it is, is being presumptuous or something. At least that's my struggle is between internally being actually very confident, but socially very reserved. Yeah. And then remember that there are things that you may say in person that you wouldn't write it down or, or vice versa. Like, yeah. uh, I'm not going to talk about my like nationality necessarily in person, but if somebody asks about it in an interview or if it's somehow like relevant to a song I'm putting out that's, you know, Spanglish, which happened, then yeah, I might mention like, yeah, I'm Colombian American, like th- those sorts of things. So it's okay to sort of add that information into your written pitch, but, um, is that going to come out, you know, language verbally? I don't know. Yeah. Well, I think it's a good time to bring up some slides, which we have. So if, if you're watching on YouTube, you will see them. If you're just listening, we'll say what the slide says. We'll, we'll, we'll mention how the artist is describing themselves, but the first example I want to point out of of something not to do is redundancy. You want to cut out extraneous words, first of all, But also, so there's being redundant with yourself, you know, you could use two or more ways of saying the same thing, but there's also being redundant with just the music world. So you said that person was like, oh, I'm so misunderstood. No one could possibly understand me. Guess what? 400,000 other artists say that same thing. And it's totally tired. I don't give a shit. Go away. Stop bugging me. So don't be redundant with the way you describe yourself. As So let's bring up a slide here. So this person, this person, now that I've gotten all testy, this person is not guilty of, of that second thing, except they say dynamic, sensitive, and personal. Now, this doesn't tell me anything about the genre or who it's for, except maybe I'm going to get something vulnerable from you, which is okay, except to me, sensitive and personal kind of mean the same thing when you're trying to use as few words as possible. I would... Mm-hmm cut one of those out and I would definitely tell more about the music. It almost feels like an oxymoron to put dynamic and then sensitive and personal as this like redundant thing next to it. Cause then I'm like, well, what's dynamic? Yeah. 
like the audio is dynamic, like your sound is dynamic. Are you yourself? I, I don't know. And then sensitive, like, okay, well, I, I guess what you're saying is it's a very intimate experience listening to your music, which I think is a lovely way of putting it. Personal is the same thing, I think. Unless sensitive means like, remember emo? <laughs> yeah, it's back, but only in more of like an indie folk way. Yeah. So I, I'm assuming that's what you mean. Like you're vulnerable in your music, but yeah, I, this, this could use a little workshopping. Yeah. Well, so yeah, I guess y- you probably already said this, but if dynamic and sensitive are at odds, you could do that thing where it's like dynamic yet sensitive. What? There definitely needs to be another few. Yet. I hate hearing Oh, you do. Okay. Yet something. Because I, you feel like it's such an oxymoron, it can't be know, true. It's done. It's overdone a little bit. But I don't know if that's on your list of things to do. Blank yet blank. No, 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 it's not. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, why we have you, the publicist, here. There's something about it that just feels like you didn't make up your mind about how to write this, or you could have written it. There's a there's a way to write that better. It just feels like a little like '90s poet. <laughs> I'm like sensitive yet. Yet. Dynamic. <laughs> All right. Well, Oscar, thanks for letting us trash on your thank you, Oscar. I'm yeah. actually really curious because I like the idea that you're sensitive mm-hmm. and I like the idea that your music is personal, but I would argue that most people would say their music is personal because it's mm-hmm. personal to them. You know? So this one needs work, but uh, let's go on to this slide. Let me see which one I was thinking about. Um, oh, <laughs> So this first person, you feel like you've heard it before, but it's probably better. And then they just have an arms up emoji as if they're confused. Like, I think they're saying like, it's probably better. That's so vague that it says nothing. It doesn't tell me the genre. It doesn't tell me who it's for. It's just maybe you think I'll feel it's familiar, in which case, why do I need it? So there's literally nothing except the hands up emoji, which tells me you at least have a sense of humor about it. I mean, I think that the sense of humor is where I would lean in, right? Like clearly you're somebody who is sort of like laughs at yourself a little bit, which is great. You could say like, I don't know what kind of music this, I mean, I, I think the fact that I'm looking at this and I don't know what kind of music it is, is a problem, right? Like I don't know what, where it falls, but it let's hypothetically say you make mellow rock I don't know. You could say like self-aware, humorous, mellow rock. Do you know what I mean? I mean, something like that. But the, you've heard it before. I don't know that it made me interested. I'm curious. I'm like, okay, well, what does that mean? I'm going to go look it up, but that's, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, like you've heard it before. It could be sort of synonymous with catchy or hooky or yeah. something or like comfortable. Familiar. Yeah. Yeah. But okay, then this next example, I have to crap on as well. It says a unique mix of guitar, keyboards, beats, and percussion swirled together. And when I first read that, I'm like, so you're a band? Mm -hmm. Like sometimes I've literally read descriptions by people who are like, it's a, it's a mesmerizing mix of melodies and rhythms. I'm like, oh, so it's music. (laughs) Like you're not telling me. Uh, Oh man, I need to go edit. I know I'm like nervous. (laughs) Someone's gonna shit all over my bio. I know people are gonna go to my website and be like, Chris, oh, you're yeah, mine is like a unique mix of music swirled together. Yeah, I hear what you're saying here. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna crap all over it because you at least told me what elements are involved. I think that it's good sometimes to give me to, if you if you can't figure out what it sounds like to at least list the instruments is fine, I guess. But I could use more. Well, except when you pick those instruments, it yeah. could be hip hop. It could I mean, be anyone, every band. It could be... Majority band has these exact instruments right. swirled together. So I felt like that was vague and redundant. Um, I feel bad. Are we? Are we being? <laughs> <laughs> yes, not, we are being mean. I think, but I'm not at you, it's with it's it's an understood issue. Like we all have a hard time with this. Just saying. Yeah. Yeah. There are some good examples in here too. Eclectic soul music. So this is... A Generic, word. I don't hate it. Yeah, so soul music is specific. I get that. It maybe has some sort of retro soul vibe. But eclectic feels vague and redundant with itself because I don't know what that means. Eclectic how? I don't know that you need to use the word music either. 
when yeah, describing your sound, just as a note. Eclectic soul is interesting. Like immediately I'm thinking, okay, well, it's soulful. And I don't know if they're saying soul music as in like soul music or if they're saying it like for, for the soul. Oh, um, you know, I definitely took music. it as like specific genre. Yeah. I mean, nine out of 10 times is probably soul music like the genre. But I, yeah, I don't hate it, it, but it is a little generic. Um, and then the word eclectic appears in this other one below it too, by a different band, invigorating, funky, electrifying. Those all work well enough for me. I don't know if you're a funk band, but again, like when we say your description doesn't need to totally pigeonhole you, it just needs to plant some curiosity. This one kind of worked for me. I think I would get more specific again. I don't know what kind of music it is other than funky sort of makes me think. It's like a groovy band. Mm -hmm. um, that's a, This is the best one I've seen so far, but yeah. it's still a challenge to fully take apart. Plus, electrifying, eclectic. Okay, so electrifying. So I like that word a lot. I use it a lot. So that makes me think it's like it's full of energy. It's energizing. It's electrifying. It's going to make your hair stand up invigorating though is the same word right. so that's a redundancy and then eclectic and funky are almost the same in some ways so yeah yeah well now to, to to give a shout out to everyone who's been brave enough for us to crap all over them thank you this person q tie says i mean that's the hardest fucking question in the world which he's talking about describing your own music so mm -hmm. <laughs> Let me go to one last slide for this section here. The bottom example here from Charlotte says, I am an indie folk contemporary country singer songwriter who writes music from experiences. So I thought a decent job of getting at what the music might sound like singer songwriter with some country influences. Cool. But who writes from experiences seemed unnecessary yeah. because everyone does, even if it's nonfiction or even if it's fiction, it's still coming from your experiences. Yeah, what about this one above it? I kind of like it atmospheric melancholic introspective with a bit of a wild side okay so i i like those words and they do paint a kind of a sort of a radio atmospheric makes sense to me maybe because i use it in my bio and melancholic okay so you're like a sad boy a little bit um mm -hmm. and then introspective i feel is redundant to melancholic in that yep. it means yes we're talking intimate music i do think that it's interesting there's a lot of people sort of using those words to describe the fact that their music isn't just like party music it's not club it's not background you know they want you to like really be in it with them that's like everybody's not everybody but a lot of our goals as musicians right is to like create these intimate experiences but yeah is that redundant that's a good question well, and the one thing I really think this one's lacking is atmospheric what? It could be EDM. It could be stadium rock. Mm -hmm. You know, there are bands that do atmospheric melancholic music that is still very anthemic and loud. Um, yeah, I think. I don't know what it is still. A really great way to reword this. And again, I don't know what type of music it is, but once again, we're just going to go with, let's come up with a new one. A R&B. So you could say atmospheric R&B with a little melancholy. And a little what? And a bit of a wild side? And a bit of a wild side. Yeah, I like the wild side I stuff. Like I like the wild side too. It makes especially me think with like, the, oh, uh, the moment of... Especially <laughs> with the emoji, the person with the, the tongue out emoji. <laughs> well, you can't put that in uh, your <laughs> press release, but... Yeah. All right. So we'll we'll uh, put away the slides for a second and return to them. That'd be good. That would be hilarious. What if you just sent out a press release that was just like emojis? A bunch of emojis like, oh my God, my album's coming out. Ah. <laughs> I think you just wrote my next PR campaign. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, go for it. Okay. So when you're just starting from scratch and you're thinking, well, how the hell do I come up with an elevator pitch now that they've crapped all over these people? I know the bar is high. Where do I begin? So just to return to my friend, Lisa Lapine, she had this thing called the Frankenstein method. And personally, I don't actually love this approach all that much, but I think it is a really good place to start. And all you're doing is taking two artists 
and you're combining them in some sentence. And she would recommend you do a classic household name that like almost everyone on the planet will recognize and combine it with a very, very current artist who is also hopefully recognizable, but that tells the person that you're, you're hip enough to still be listening to music. You're, you know, you're relevant. So she had an example at the time where she was working with this band that kept saying they sounded like XTC and like bookers were like, I don't know. They were from 15 years ago. What does that mean? But then she was like, Oh, it's like spin doctors meets talking heads or something. This was in the nineties. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. And suddenly all the bookers were like, Oh, I get a clear picture of what that is. Let's hire them. So I would listen to that band. Um, <laughs> spin doctors. Yeah. Oh. Talking heads. Absolutely. I think that it's very easy, especially now there's so much music coming out. There's so, and it's it, like very easily accessible to find the most underground of underground. I mean, back in the days it was like crate digging to find or like going to underground shows, but now you can just like go on Spotify and just like go down a, a playlist rabbit hole until you find like the most underground artists. And you're like, Oh, I found them first. But uh, it is very easy to like go down that path and be like, well, I sound like, you know, and then list off a bunch of artists that, you know, your scene recognizes, but the majority of people don't. So right. finding and and I don't think that that means that you have to say you sound like Lady Gaga, but finding an artist that you like that, you know, has made at least a little bit of success, like in press. You also have to cater this to your to who you're saying this to right so we've talked about if it's to your grandma just go ahead and say lady gaga if it's to like don't say like well i sound like like a kaliuchis I me mean, it's like she doesn't care who that is right but if you're talking to your local scene and you've got similar artists that you've been playing with you could maybe mention them if you're talking on a national scene or to a publication finding artists that you do like really like that you respect is a good way to go about it. I also think it's good to give shout outs to artists that give you inspiration. So mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that you need to like fully throw away the idea of some of these, you know, sort of underground people, but pepper them in, use them mm -hmm. as like the pepper of making this interesting. Yeah. A couple of the ones I came up with while I was writing this list was like, using talking talking heads meets doja cat or like yeah. if little nas x produced the next frank sinatra record or something like that and that i would listen to all of these things you just described <laughs> well and then i was also proud of us like a year ago we came up with a description for your music which i don't know if you hate it because i don't think you've ever used it but it was if barbara streisand mm -hmm. sang for future islands oh yeah totally Wow. So, How have I not used that? That's I don't know. What the heck? very good. Cool. I think it's because I, I personally don't think I could hold up barber chops, but it's kind. Yeah. I get, get interesting with it. That's totally acceptable, but just remember who you're talking to and don't be upset if they don't know. <laughs> like, yeah, that's true. Like, don't be upset if they've never heard of little Nas X. You know what I mean? But they will have heard of Frank Sinatra. So that's the thing of pairing the new with the old. You're at least giving them one thing yeah. to, to, yeah, to reference. All right. So we're going to go back to the slides here. And this one is down at the bottom by Mike Bankhead. I make hooky Midwestern rock with strong power pop influences. Think Fountains of Wayne covering Guided by Voices in the style of super drag. So I like all that. I guess if I was going to get really picky, I'd say um, hooky Midwestern rock and power pop could be synonymous so you could say i make midwestern power pop or something like that but i do like all those examples you gave what what's your thoughts on that one i kind of like it all yeah i mean i don't mind with blank blank influences so you're basically saying undertones of power pop yeah i don't hate this one i actually really like it and i'm very very interested in your music mike bankhead yeah. And then if we go up a little bit, there's Matthew Whiteside. It says contemporary classical and experimental electronic music with an abstract story. Think Johan Johansson, Micah Levy, and Hildur Guna Dieter, not ambient piano. So I do like how specific this is. I know what the audience is going for is. My problem is I don't know that style of music enough to know anyone he referenced. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. I mean, I don't think that 
there's anything wrong if if your world is so specific. I mean, classical, electronic, experimental music, I don't think you need to say with an abstract story because that's already abstract enough. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the end, it says not ambient piano. So I don't think you need to say what it's not. Just say what it is. And then... As far as these artists, if this is your world and those artists are really big in that world, maybe this works. If they're, if it's not, if they're not that big, then maybe just throw in some composer that you know everybody has heard of that you at least identify with in some way. Yeah. And I think in terms of saying it's not ambient piano, if what you're trying to get at there is like, this isn't your peaceful background music. Yeah. You could say that about what it is. Maybe it's abrasive. Maybe it's got a really avant-garde noise element. Just you could put those descriptors into what it is if it's really important to you to say what it's not. I think that one thing that this person might be trying to point out, which is actually a good point to make, is that within every genre, there are like tons of subgenres. So within ambient music in particular, I know because I really like ambient music, I like to make it, but there is so many, there are so many people using that term when it that's not really what the music is. So for example, a lot of experimental electronic music is ambient, but it's not like calm, soothing piano sounds. And so I think that's what they're trying to say, but it's about finding a way to say it without putting a negative in there. Totally. So on this, if we go to the very top of this slide, Shadow of Everest, they say when Mastodon and Tool really love each other, they have a baby. We are that baby raised on a steady diet of Zeppelin and Black Sabbath. So the oh, like, <laughs> it's very clear about what the music sounds like. I have a slight problem with the like the love child of Elvis Presley and, yeah, you know, uh -huh. the, it's the same problem as blank yet blank. Yeah, it's just yeah. that's an overused way of saying mm -hmm. you're influenced by these bands. The other thing I kind of thought, I think, I think it's enough to refer to one you know, 21st century rock band and one 1970s band. Like I didn't need Sabbath and Zeppelin. Maybe Mastodon and Tool yeah. should both be in there. Maybe, but I think there's a quicker way to say what you sound like and, and still have the same effect. Mm -hmm. Somebody who's clearly very in, influenced by the music they listen to. One way to go about describing your sound then is maybe looking at the bios of each of those four artists finding the the words they're using to describe their music and then figuring out the salad of how that best describes yours. Yeah. Finding out the words that don't work in their bios too. Like, you know, if your music isn't heavy rock and you find that in Black Sabbath, then you know to take that out and, and that's how you describe it. Did you just use the word salad? I did. Because it's in one of these descriptions that I wanted. To wow. Think. So S-E-Z... Uh, describes their music as indie rock, punk, homemade, half-cooked meat salad. Okay, well, I love you, S-E-Z. Um, for yeah, this, we don't want to eat a half-cooked meat salad. Clearly, we have the same language. Homemade, half-cooked meat salad. Yeah, I like your sense of humor quite a bit. That sells me. But... All I am getting from this is that it's indie rock punk. Yeah, well, so I, I didn't know if I should take the ha half-cooked meat salad as you're an absurdist and you have a sense of humor, mm -hmm. or if you're trying to say that your music is dangerous and is going to kill people who eat it. Like, I think it's an absurdist. I mean, that's yeah. my first take as an absurdist. Okay. I, like, I like that, of course, but you also have to remember that like, it takes one to know one, like not everyone's going to fully understand what you're meaning here. And a lot of people will have the gross out factor of being like, ugh, needs yeah. <laughs> that. Like, so you will definitely turn off a lot of people, but maybe that's your intention. And that's fine to describe your music in a way that turns people away. Totally. I know the homemade was in reference to the meat salad, but like something like homemade punk. Mm -hmm. uh, Cause I don't think you need to say indie rock punk. I think probably punk is enough. Maybe. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Homemade indie punk rock could work. Although what does homemade really serve the purpose of? True. Oof. Next episode, we need to edit each other's bios, huh? 
Oh God, we could have a little segment. <laughs> That's only fair after we're shitting on all these people. Yeah. So Anna Marie says, alternative pop rock mixed with a little bit of country influence. Someone in the UK once told me that Taylor Swift can take a day off now. So I actually like that second yeah. sentence to get at what your influences are and that you're like doing a good job of it. I feel like there might be something, some way to make this better, but it's not coming to me off the top of my head. Once described as Taylor Swift on a day off, <laughs> this Anna Marie delivers alternative pop rock mixed with a little bit of country and a lot of love. There you go. Just there really you go. Anna Marie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's the thing. Like with like with meat salad and this one, I do think it's okay to tell a story. We're not saying like pare it down, don't say anything interesting, don't be funny. I like humor. I think humor is a great thing to add to your bio if you're a funny person and that's a part of your music. And with this, like this is an interesting anecdote. I think you can use that. I don't actually have many issues with this one. Yeah. All right. Anna, you get an A minus. Um, let's see. Arch critic. <laughs> um, acoustic guitar with vocals sitting around a campfire. Hmm. Isn't acoustic guitar already stripped down? Yeah, that was okay. my, so I don't mind the campfire reference. Cause it gives me like warm vibes. I get it's folky. Um, and but with it, vocals like, okay. So you sing. Yep. But it needs something else for sure. How about intimate campfire acoustic guitar? I don't know. Something like that. <laughs> intimate campfire. Yeah. Or, I don't know. Campfire folk or something. Yeah. Like that. I think campfire says so much that like you could almost go in a different direction than needing to say anything about a guitar or vocals or intimate. Cause like campfire kind of implies that. Yeah. Like, and like what kind of vocals I now I'm really curious how you could describe that a little differently. Yeah. So then we have a band called Taking Anderson. They say acoustic alternative rock with a splash of country. Dave Matthews meets Zach Brown band. So this gives me a very clear picture of what you sound like. I almost think that Dave Matthews meets Zach Brown band says what you said in the first sentence, acoustic mm. alternative rock with a splash of country. So maybe there's, maybe your sound is already in the artist you're using and then you can say something else. I don't think there's anything wrong with this one if it's part of a larger statement. If this is the paragraph and this is like sentences three and four of the paragraph, then that's fine. But yeah, for like a one liner, it's an, an unnecessary add on. But if it's like I said, I think if it's a part of a paragraph, it's OK to say who your influences are. Yeah. Somewhere in there. All right. We've got one more example, I think, for this category. And so imagine a contemporary Hall and Oates. Um, yeah. Actually, a couple examples, because then down below that, I like this one. Electro Clash Eurythmics. Sinister in a good way. And okay. I love the word sinister in that description. I love ethereal wave acid. Ethereal wave acid. I probably would word it like acid wave, just because people love to add wave to the end of things now, like me. I have swim wave, but <laughs> ethereal gives me something. I'm like, oh, yeah, like we're in a sort of electronic ethereal world is what my assumption is. And then acid wave or wave acid means it's going to be like electronic for sure and a little hypnotic. Yeah. And I think because that's so short, you I mean, you could leave it at that ethereal acid wave, but it also gives you space to play with if you want to do some of what we're going to talk about later in this episode of defining who it's for or what it's mm -hmm, about. Mm -hmm. And then just to return to Brett Scheiber, who says rock and soul, imagine a contemporary Hall and Oates. I think it's pretty good in terms of the sound. I, I feel like it could do more in, in terms of who it's for, or what it's about. Maybe contemporary <laughs> Hall and Oates sort of says rock and soul. So it's a bit redundant. Yeah. I mean, yes. Saying Hall and Oates is evocative enough, but how do you say that without saying hollow notes? Oh, there you go. No can do. <laughs> Boy, I was waiting for something. I uh, mean, love hollow notes, but imagine a contemporary hollow notes is a hard sentence for me because there are a lot of them right now. So mm. I don't need to imagine it. 
So what I would like is for you to tell me how, what this sounds like a little differently. I don't know. I feel bad about not giving a solid answer on this one. That's okay. Brett has something to think about. All right. So another method of describing music is something I call I'm right for you method. Mm. Defining your subgenre and your audience in the same sentence. So basically it's like I make blank for blank. And some of the examples I have are like outlaw country for white collar criminals, mm -hmm. nerd rap for soccer moms, post punk for your next protest, something like that. I, I don't think those are all that great. But one thing I can see people saying is like, yeah, but my music's for more than just soccer moms. Well, of course, all you're doing again is just painting a picture and we're all imaginative, empathetic enough people to like see ourselves in it, even if we're not technically in the audience you're defining. Yeah, I think that's a great way to put it. It's very direct. Well, we have some examples, I think. Let me pull them up here. Philosophical folk rock for adventurers. Oh, nice. I liked it. I know it's folk rock. I know you're philosophical, so your music's probably deep, but it's also fun and, well, I shouldn't say, it. I know it's fun, but I know it's for people who are willing to take risks and they're out there. Like, I think this is a great example. Do you have any beef with that one? Not at all, but now I'm, I got distracted and now I'm looking at hip hop Homer epic poems about life in the suburbs. I liked this one. Did you like it? I love it. I don't even need the other part. I think you oh. could say hip hop Homer epic poems set to rap about life in the suburbs or like delivered through rap about life in the suburbs, something like that. It could just be one sentence, but I love this very, very much. Well, and so this is by someone named Black Bourbon. And I actually like the first sentence too. It says, I create relatable rap that makes the ordinary sound dope. So from that, I just like relatable rap. I mean, it's mm -hmm. got that like assonance thing going, but also like, I liked that relatable rap. I don't know. Seemed like a new take on spinning. I also genre. would, if I were to come up with a rap or like a genre for this, would say dad rap. Oh, dad rap. Yes. Okay. All right. So good job, Black Bourbon. We are going to slide two here. Okay. So I posted on my Instagram and this was a friend oh. wrote, wrote me this one. Country music for people who like modern country, but who liked 90s country more. Love I it. liked it because it was funny. I mean, I know you're going to be poppy and palatable enough for people who are just listening to modern country, but you like Garth Brooks more. Like, uh, The first thing I want to say is that I can tell from the screenshot that I viewed the story because I see oh, that yeah, you did. on there. That's cool. Um, I need to get off social media. No, this is fantastic. I think it's like very, very, what you're doing is you're delivering a little nugget to, to the person you're trying to reach in particular. You're saying, yeah, this is country music, but hey, if you liked Clueless, you know, like that sort of thing. Yeah. And I like that, that there's humor, but there's also judgment. Like, cause I can hear you saying like, yeah, country's fine now, but it actually kind of sucks. Mm -hmm. So fair. you're like, you got that little jagged, jab in there too <laughs> yes which by the way i heard an interview with the editor of pitchfork the other day and she said jagged little pill is her guilty pleasure mm. so i feel like i can go back to that album now uh okay so alex whitmore says home cooked texas style with humor for dessert i like the direction of this one but i think it needs something texas more. style what that's what we want to know. Is it yeah. Texas style country, Texas style hip hop, Texas style folk? So you just add that one little word in there and I'm, I'm good to go with the sentence. Well, just these two strike me. The next two are a little bit more like the Frankenstein thing, but John Allen James says, people tell me I sound like Bob Dylan, except on key, <laughs> which I liked because it's funny. You could just say like Dylan, but in yeah. tune or something I like, like that. And then I like Lance Turner's description, Pink Floyd on the same stage with Nirvana and John Prine. I think you could simplify that, like John Prine backed by Pink Floyd or with something Nirvana like that. Nirvana on bass. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, then we'll go on to this one, which was indie pop. This is from Gen Vix. Indie pop, but with fat beats to shake your car and your ass. I think it could be said a little better personally, but I like, I know the genre and I know it's for like dancing and driving around. Yeah, I love it. I'll say booty shaking uh, indie pop. 
Yeah. And then let me see. I got to go to slide number 12. Love this it. was okay. This was a friend of mine making a joke. I think he said his music was loser rock. And even though I pretty sure he meant it as a joke, I loved it. I love it. It painted and it's two words and it painted it. I mean, I just hear Beck, you know? Yeah. But it's great. Yeah. Okay. So this person here said, Do you consider yourself a nature lover? And then they <laughs> go on to kind of describe some Hindi music. But I liked at least that it was started with like, this is who it's for. Like, I think you could do a better job of making it all concise. Um, but music it. for nature lovers is is good. And you did a really good job of making sure to pitch the next single you have. So while this may <laughs> not have been the assignment, you did the extra credit. Yeah. Okay. So then we got one more sort of technique uh, to describe and uh, some more examples to go through and then we can wrap up. But the last approach I have is more of like a situational or story method, which I don't necessarily mean is you telling your whole story, but an example is I worked in the shoe factory to save up enough money to get the hell out of my hometown and move to LA. But now I find myself missing that simplicity and isolation. So there's a longing in my slow folk songs, mm -hmm. trying to sing my way towards sanity amidst the flashing lights and buzzing apps. That's way too long, but that's the sort of picture I'm trying to paint. It's like, um, and then another one is like, what if you were the last person on earth? You'd still need a dance anthem. This is EDM for end times. It's wow. like putting someone in a situation where they immediately also know I need that or I don't need that. I, it's a great tool. Absolutely. And so I felt like we have some examples where people are sort of going for that. Um, okay. This was a total joke by a ridiculous friend who wasn't even describing his music, but he said, explosive diarrhea at a neighbor's K Mary Kay party. And although that's disgusting and ridiculous, I was like, oh, if that was actually the description of a music, I, I just would listen to it. One descriptor of what type of music it is, and then I would be okay with it. Like if it was like explosive punk rock diarrhea at your mom's Mary Kay party, like that, okay, it tells me it's like rebellious, crazy wild music that's going to piss off some stuck up ladies. But like, <laughs> that's fine. That's hilarious. But I need to know, like, if this was serious, hypothetically, just give me like the one word that lets me know what kind of music. That's all. Yeah. Just one. Okay, this one. Hudson Delta sounds like a New Yorker on a Southern road trip. I mean, Which it's I a great title. If that's your band name, then you just described it. Yeah, I get the whole picture. Yeah. It's probably some urban hipsterism and then some Southern rock or country and yeah. you're on an adventure. So I love that one. Well, they did a good job naming their band. Yeah. The pros. The campfire example kind of reminded me of like, it's a situation, mm -hmm. it's a story you could paint. So it's like, if you were the last musician singing at a campfire during the zombie apocalypse or whatever, like just some extra story. Okay, we're out of brave examples and we're out of tips Thank unless you, you have any who put themselves out there like that. I'm sure that was hard and I hope we don't come off like total bottles. I'm sure we, I'm sure <laughs> I did. But get oh, you know what? How about for anyone whose feelings are hurt, go on my website, yeah. my about page, take anything you want, copy it and then just crap on it on Twitter. It's fine. Yeah. There you go. Do that. Don't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, all right. Well, I hope we helped in any remote way. Just remember that the, the people that love you actually might have really, really good input on how to help describe you. And don't shy away from some of those more general things that you might feel you're way too cool for. It's okay to sound like other people. And it's okay to also like steal a bio from one of your favorite artists and tweak it for yourself it doesn't mean like verbatim be like i was born taylor swift and i play folk. you know like just see what people are doing it's okay to, imitation is important blah, blah blah you know this yeah and i guess we should say also if you have a description you're really proud of we would love to see it read it you can tag us on twitter if you want to call in on our listener line 360-524-2209 360-524-2209, or you can write an email to podcast at cdbabypodcast.com. We'd love to hear your descriptions. We, we probably won't critique them as thoroughly as we have today, but yeah, 
Kevin will be back next week, I think. Uh, we've got a lot of episodes ready. And we hope to see you at our conference. See you then. See ya. Thanks, Christina. Bye, everybody. See Peace. ya. Thank <laughs> you.